Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this uh, webinar. We're going to wait a few seconds until everybody join us. But in the meantime, I'm just going to be sharing a screen. Uh, so I would, so I have a presentation to share the screen. PowerPoint share, let's see. No, let's see, cancel. So let's see if this is will get us to the, okay, so now we have the screen and I'm hoping that you're able to see what I'm seeing in here in terms of the presentation. Uh, so again, the topic for today uh, that I wanted to cover let me see, maybe there's some people that are on the uh, wait list, but so the the topic for me today is uh, racism, uh, neoliberalism, uh, militarism, and police violence. And uh, some might think that these are disconnected as uh, topics to be included, but I, once I go through it, you'll find out at least uh, from my perspective, uh, the uh, linkages that are there. Uh, so to begin with, I wanted to define what is a neoliberalism, uh, leaving aside the uh, definition of race and racism to the side as a socially constructed uh, uh, term uh, and uh, that has uh, been socially uh, uh, given certain meaning and uh, certain power within society. Uh, but let me get into uh, what neoliberalism is uh, because it's often taken for granted uh, outside the United States. Uh, there is considerable writing and engagement with the term uh, but uh, in the US, at least in the political discourses, uh, it is not actually as much engaged with. Uh, so neoliberalism is an economic ideology. So it's actually an ideology uh, and a frame of uh, frame and a patterns of thinking that refers to market oriented and driven policies. Uh, which seeks to eliminate price controls, uh, deregulate capital markets, uh, and uh, lower trade barriers and reduce state uh, influence, especially through pushing privatization and austerity programs. Uh, now, neoliberalism is in essence to distinguish between liberalism uh, as a type of economic uh, thinking that originates from Adam Smith and really coming into end or hitting a brick wall uh, in the early, uh, uh, in the mid to late 1920s, culminating with the Great Depression, uh, where this notion of uh, liberalism as far as an economic idea uh, was replaced with the New Deal and Keynesian economics took hold with the push toward full employment and uh, greater state uh, participation with regulations as well as making sure that uh, the markets operate uh, with the broader interests of the society. And uh, this uh, new deal of economics continues all the way up to the early to mid seventies and then it gets to be replaced by the introduction of uh, neoliberalism that interestingly first uh, accepted by Carter, uh, President Carter, but then really uh, was pushed very heavily during Reagan, uh, Reagan's administration here in the US and Margaret Tar Thatcher uh, in the UK. And we've been at it uh, since uh, then in a 
one way or the other, both Democrats and Republicans uh, here in the United States, uh, left and right in uh, Europe, and also has been used as the tool uh, across the global south, whether during the uh, various rounds of negotiations for GAD, General Agreement of Trade and Tariffs, uh, or the uh, subsequent uh, adoption of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, so the global system, as far as the economic system right now, uh, is structured around uh, neoliberalism. Uh, it insists on uh, elevating the rule of the market, meaning nothing should interfere uh, with the market. But in here, one has to understand that the market is really uh, uh, heavily tilted toward uh, those that have uh, the massive resources. So the notion that is free market is free as long as you have the resources to play in the market. Uh, cutting public expenditure for social services, uh, and that's where you see this whole notion of reforming welfare program that the state should not be in the business of uh, providing support for uh, people that everybody should pull themselves out of their bootstraps. And it, there is a highly racialized discourse around this. Uh, uh, for those who observe uh, the political ads, they're heavily racialized ads. Uh, so the race plays a role into uh, how uh, cutting social programs and social services. Uh, third is deregulations, uh, making sure that uh, uh, regulations are thrown out, uh, out of the window, uh, any protection to the citizens, any protection for uh, labor, environmental protection, uh, any of uh, the regulations that might interfere from the perspective of the neoliberal economists with uh, the rule of the market should be uh, expunged and thrown out. And again, both Democrats and Republicans, left and right uh, uh, across the political spectrum have engaged because they all have been playing from the same uh, toolkit of uh, adopting neoliberal economic modalities. Uh, the push to privatization, especially privatization of uh, uh, public uh, sector, the sector that provides these services so that where you have uh, at least the most uh, pernicious part of it, for example, is the uh, privatization of the prison uh, system. Uh, uh, as we speak today about the massive number of refugees and uh, immigrants, refugees in Europe and immigrants here in the United States that are held in detention camps, uh, most of these detention camps are private uh, enterprises. So there's an incentive or almost a compelling interest uh, to keep uh, these uh, refugees and immigrants held up uh, for the longer period. In many parts of the global south, uh, privatization of water, uh, ways and access to water, privatization of the electric grid, uh, privatization of the telecommunication sector, and uh, finally the uh, privatization of the financial markets, uh, where we get all kinds of uh, pernicious uh, financial uh, tools that are put in place. So deregulations and privatization uh, go hand in hand. And then eliminating the concept of the public good or the community. Uh, I think this is for anyone that is engaged in education and knows that there's been a heavy, heavy uh, assault on uh, public education as being public good and transform it into a commodity uh, that needs to be, in essence, uh, sold to the consumer. So the student education enterprise is no longer a public good, but rather a commodity. And the student is a consumer and the uh, faculty is a frontline manager. So all this in general is also uh, affecting even the academic institutions. And then the whole push to privatize uh, uh, public schools uh, through first starving the public schools from resources and then claiming that they're failing and then pushing for shifting the resources into vouchers and uh, privatizing uh, public education, which in essence actually leaves those who are 
already at the margins uh, without the needed resources in there. So that's the neoliberalism. Now it's important to think that there are some key neoliberal institutions that uh, no one would actually know that these are neoliberal institutions that push for neoliberal uh, economics. Uh, first and foremost among them, American Enterprise Institute in Washington DC, the Heritage Foundation, uh, the Cato Institute, uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, Center for Policy Studies, Adam Smith Institute, and then a host of academic positions and departments in universities, particularly at the University of Chicago and Virginia, as well as others, uh, that all are, uh, in essence, the uh, practitioners, the uh, uh, experts, the papers that are written, the publications. So there's a whole in, in overwhelming structure in there uh, that works in uh, the field of neoliberal uh, economics. Now, neoliberalism has produced uh, one of the most um, lopsided uh, structures of inequality in the world. And I'm using in here the report that was published by Oxfam uh, in January uh, that looks at inequality. They're focused, uh, rightly so, on uh, the inequality relative to women labor and uh, their presence within the global economy. But there are certain areas that we actually could look at in the broader sense of what is taking place in the inequalities. Um, now, the world's billionaire, uh, billionaires, there's only, uh, according to Oxfam, total of 2,153 individuals in 2019 who have more wealth between them than 4.6 billion people. So if you take the billionaire class, uh, in the world today, uh, across the world, uh, 2,153 people in 2019. Between these 2,153 people, they have more than 4.6 billion people. Now, just recently, um, just in the past three months, the uh, billionaire class have increased their wealth in the three months of the COVID-19 period uh, by some estimate of $249 billion. Uh, again, depending on what's the stock market and the uh, economic activity. So even this picture of more than 4.6 billion people have just accelerated, even if we think about the three months uh, period since the onset of COVID-19 uh, 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 globally. And the overwhelming number of these 2,153 individuals live in the global north, uh, meaning in uh, Europe, uh, mostly also in the United States, Canada, and other countries. Definitely, there's a number in China that are coming into this uh, group, uh, but still the world is tilted toward in the global north. Now, the combined wealth of the world's 22 richest men is more than the wealth of all the women in Africa. So if you take all of the women in Africa together combined, uh, the 22 richest men uh, have more wealth uh, than this group uh, combined. So that just gives you uh, the level of uh, wealth concentration. Another uh, way to look at um, the inequality, it, if you save $10,000 a day, uh, since the building of the pyramids in Egypt, you would have only one-fifth the average fortune of the five richest billionaires. So again, think of uh, the period of the building of the pyramids over 2,000 years. And if you save $10,000 a day since the building of the pyramids, you will still have only one-fifth the average fortune of the richest of the five richest billionaires. Uh, the world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. So again, the richest 1% have twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. Again, this have accelerated as a result of neoliberal economics that made it possible to accelerate uh, the rate of wealth accumulation uh, as well as the uh, uh, laying hands on assets 
uh, across the global south, but also internally here uh, in the United States and in Europe, also a massive shift of resources as a result both of uh, the change in the tax system, as well as one of the most important for US uh, basis is the reduction on the capital gains tax, which is the tax that levied on uh, stocks and investment, which uh, almost uh, one third of the wealth that is made by the top 1% is made out of capital gains tax. So these are distributive. So there has been a massive wealth distribution from the bottom up uh, through this neoliberal economic modality. Now, another way to look at uh, in here in terms of unpaid labor, uh, the value and the monetary value of unpaid care work globally for women age 15 and, uh, and over is at least uh, 10.8 trillion annually, which means three times the size of the world's tech industry. So if we think about the wealth of the tech industry and what they produce, the unpaid care work, meaning the work that is not being compensated, uh, is estimated to be at 10.8 trillion annually. And if that takes on an, an annual basis and continues, you could see the, the disparity. Uh, taxing an additional 0.5% of the wealth of the richest one percent over the next 10 years is equal to investment needed to create 117 million jobs in education, healthcare, uh, elderly care, and other sectors, and to close the care deficit. So again, we're not talking about a massive, uh, almost a half a percent of uh, taxes will result in 117 million jobs. So just think about the scope of the tax cut that has been given and what was lost uh, as a result of it. Now, there is a looming also crisis. And by 2013, there will be an estimated 100 million older people and 100 million uh, children 6 to 14 years old. Uh, so uh, in, if we think about the neoliberal economics and who is being left out of this, uh, there are massive uh, needs that are there. And then 2.4 billion people worldwide could be living in areas without much water uh, as a result of climate change. Uh, we think about uh, the water in Michigan. Uh, and uh, now think of areas around the world right now that is without water and will increase so by 2025. And if we add to it the privatization that is also being pushed in many places, uh, we're going to have a massive both environmental crisis, but also uh, conflicts that are arising as a result of almost wrong-headed uh, economic plans altogether. So I spoke about the uh, returns to rich shareholders have increased dramatically, while real wages have or have barely increased at all. So. Uh, uh, the growth between 2011 and 2017, average wages in G7 countries barely increased by 3% over a, a six-year period, while the dividend to wealthy shareholders uh, have increased by 31%. Now, we know that this concept of trickle-down economics is also part of the neoliberal economics. And uh, what often the reduction in uh, taxes have, uh, especially to the wealthy, did not really create jobs. If in essence, it's actually recycled back into uh, uh, for companies and corporation uh, stock uh, buybacks, which actually increase the level of dividend that is paid uh, for uh, the wealthy who have often uh, preferred stocks within these companies and therefore, what we need to actually constantly pay attention is who actually gets the burden when tax cuts are uh, at place. Now, I want to shift to the second part of my uh, uh, layered pieces is to speak about militarism. And in here, uh, uh, President Dwight Eisenhower, who actually spoke of the military industrial complex, uh, who actually spoke about uh, uh, to guard against uh, the acquisition of unwarranted influence, uh, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. 
the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. So what we have today is that we are dealing with a military uh, industrial complex. Uh, and to be, to, we define it as a network of individuals and institutions uh, involved in the productions of weapons and military technology. Uh, the military industrial complex is a country typically, in a country typically attempts to marshal political support for continued or increased military spending by the national government. And what we need to also to look is into the layered aspect of the military industrial complex. So you have the actual uh, budgets that are uh, put uh, at the national level, Congress, Senate, and then the president. Uh, the companies that are uh, connected to the contracts uh, with the relationship with the Department of Defense and the military. Then you have uh, all the other private institutions. So for example, the tech industry is heavily vested in the military industrial complex, even though that we think otherwise, but it is actually, uh, it is. And some of the technologies that uh, often have been funded uh, through the Department of Defense, then it gets a civilian spin, uh, a spillover or a civilian sp spinning uh, technologies that benefits the civilian. But at the core of it, much of the technology actually uh, is uh, integrated into the military industrial complex, the surveillance, uh, the facial recognition, uh, the tracking devices, all this uh, element is connected. And then also, to think about the military industrial complex as it relates to educational institutions than the universities and uh, how also they produce a particular type of thinking uh, that is directly connected to the military industrial complex. So again, this is what where we are at this point uh, uh, with a massive budget, uh, some $732 billion. Now, who benefits from war and militarism? Uh, this is actually, if you think about the different uh, companies um, in relations to uh, their benefit, defense contract values per company since 2006. Uh, and Lockheed Martin, Boeing, uh, Northrop uh, uh, Grumman, Raytheon, General Dynamics, uh, BAE System, and so on, McDonnell Douglas, General Electric, uh, what is interesting is many of these conglomerate massive uh, companies are also connected to other types of uh, our economy. For example, uh, owning portions of the media. So the media becomes also an extension of uh, these behemoths that are literally uh, engaged in an economy of death uh, and producing death machines and that's a growth industry for them. So the business of war is war. And uh, as such, they are uh, really taking the massive resources from the society. And you have almost a bottomless bit of resources. Uh, there's never no uh, for increased military budget and expenditure, uh, but opening a school, opening a hospital or getting the PPE uh, uh, individuals who were in the hospitals had to actually don on uh, garbage bags to protect themselves. While the, if you notice during the police protest, all the police were actually dressed up uh, like uh, stormtroopers from Star Wars with full gear that is at the highest level of protection uh, facing protesters, peaceful protesters uh, in the streets. Uh, so when it came to the virus, we actually uh, uh, gave people garbage bags uh, to protect themselves against the virus, uh, while uh, individuals uh, exercising their uh, constitutional rights to protest and petition their government for redress, rightly so, uh, were met with the most protective gear uh, that you can get, and so many layers, including uh, uh, armored carrier. So again, these are the relationship uh, of who benefits from war and militarism. Uh, military industrial complex and it's the economy. So in here, this was when uh, John Bolton, uh, he was the national security advisor, uh, he was actually calling for uh, 
bombing Iran, bombing North Korea, and so on. And uh, you could see the stock market uh, individuals uh, following the news uh, because again, they're in the business of uh, death machines and it's a growth industry. So go long on Lockheed Martin, give me General Dynamics, uh, Northrop, Northrop Grumman. So again, uh, whenever there is actually a war or conflicts on the these uh, stocks tend to actually increase and rise uh, because it's a growth industry and a business. And we could see this, uh, oil hits eight month high, US airstrikes, airstrikes kill top Iranian general. What you look at, look at the defense stocks. Uh, and on this side, the Dow is actually 243 points down, but all these companies, uh, that are in the business of manufacturing death machines and uh, uh, missiles and so on are a growth industry. So militarism is at, really is connected and at the um, uh, almost at the seams of our uh, economy. Uh, President Trump often says that uh, Boeing accounts for 1% of our uh, good domestic product, which is uh, considerable for one company. Uh, but is also vested in uh, military industrial complex production as well as civilian production. And that's again, this relationship between the military and civilian uh, becomes rooted in how uh, militarism and the military industrial complex is uh, structured and layered in our society. The United States spends more on defense than the next 10 countries combined. And this is uh, from 2019. Uh, 732 billions, and then all the other 10 countries, China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia actually, you need, their expenditure is a, almost uh, a byproduct of uh, funneling their money and resources into our economy. So when it has to actually account it as part of our own uh, military industrial complex, because we've, we actually, um, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is a cash cow that we depend on to continue jobs and having jobs here in the U.S. by means of selling them weapons that often are used and deployed in uh, the regional conflict. But you could see in here the United States expenditure, it's a full-fledged economy uh, that is there. So people who are calling for uh, uh, massive cuts in the military budget, uh, including Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the Progressive Caucus, one can see and take a look at what we're, uh, we are experiencing relative to the budget. And this is, does not account also for the heavy expenditure in local policing. Uh, uh, when we looked at the New York Police Department, which is something else also, that the New York Police Department is actually $5.7 billion with 70,000 uh, police officers. You're talking about a massive, if it's a country, it's a massive military uh, apparatus and you take it across the country. Uh, one feature uh, that we are uh, thinking or you could actually uh, increasingly witness is the uh, prevalence of uh, all types of police. You have, uh, you know, for us in here at Lee, I'm speaking to you in Berkeley, you have the Berkeley, po the Ber Berkeley police, the uh, city police, then we have a campus police, uh, likewise. Then you have a BART police that also is in the BART uh, part stations with the train stations. Then you have uh, the sheriff, uh, then you have the private security uh, companies, then you add the federal uh, through a variety of different joint terrorism task forces, FBI and so on. Then you have uh, also some are of the military police uh, that in the surrounding area, and then uh, other elements in there. So uh, in essence, if we think about what we spend on military security and policing, uh, it is no wonder that we have so many homeless people on the streets because it's a matter of priorities, that our priority is to invest in death machines, in weapons, in uh, storm, uh, storm troopers, rather than actually addressing the basic needs of the human beings. And for anyone that visit Berkeley or San Francisco, you would see the uh, overwhelming increase in number of homeless. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that is uh, going across uh, the country. 
uh, since 9-11, the U.S. has spent $7 trillion on uh, dead-end wars and armaments and uh, bombings and so on. And the end result, again, as Martin Luther King said, the bombs that are at the time thrown in Vietnam blows up in our inner cities. And we're seeing this, uh, in essence, in front of our eyes. And then the other part will be the opioid addiction, uh, which also companies that have pushed the opioid uh, on uh, population, for example, Johnson & Johnson. Now, you know, Johnson & Johnson, we think of it as being this nice, soft, cuddly company that take care of our uh, kids and children. You go into the store, all of the Johnson & Johnson's, father, but Johnson & Johnson is a drug dealer, a drug dealer in terms of the pushing of the opioid, uh, no worse than the drug dealers that we often uh, talk about in terms of drug dealing. Uh, so you don't see the president speaking about uh, Johnson & Johnson as being the drug dealers that push the opioid on uh, uh, unsuspecting uh, Americans uh, on, a, on a regular basis and making billions of dollars. And then when they finally get caught, a slap on the hand and uh, get a fine that they pay. And then they're actually uh, appeal the fine and reduce the fine. Uh, so if you make $10 billion and you pay a fine of 200 billion or 300 million, that's a good deal in any given day. And this, you can't tell me like a company like Johnson & Johnson does not know that a doctor that is actually putting a prescription of 10,000 pills of opioid to a small town uh, that Johnson & Johnson salespeople don't know that this is actually uh, using it as a, uh, a drug mill, uh, but they continue to push it because it's good for the bottom line. So again, uh, just adding all this into the picture can give us a sense of what we are dealing. Uh, this is the Trump's fiscal 2020 discretionary budget request. Uh, and defense is uh, 57 uh, billion, uh, uh, 718 billion with 57%. Uh, but this is actually, it's also a misnomer because you also have to add to it the veteran affairs, which is accounts for 7%. Uh, there are also uh, homeland security that is also have $52 billion. Uh, there's element of the energy uh, that is also uh, added into expenditure to uh, the, uh, uh, the defense and military. And then also one is a big area that is unaccounted for is the service on the debt that is acquired uh, during previous uh, periods. Uh, and that debt is uh, overwhelmingly was acquired as a result of uh, the military industrial complex and the wars. So all this you could see is the big sucking engine uh, of the military industrial complex that is shaping and uh, reorienting our priorities in the country. Uh, you would also look at the companies which I show and share of sales by top 100 companies uh, in the world. So the United States account for 59% uh, of the 100 companies that sell weapons uh, in the world. So we're number one, uh, which also raises the question often when we are speaking about wanting to have peace around the world, but we're actually selling the weapons that cause and continue to uh, foment uh, the war. Uh, so uh, you cannot be advocating peace while at the same time actually selling weapons to parties that are committed uh, to the war and continue to use those uh, weapons for war. Which gets us into just, just briefly about uh, Yemen, uh, the top five Yemen war profiteers. Uh, so anyone with a clear sense of conscience will know that uh, uh, the war in Yemen is uh, has been disastrous. It's a uh, uh, a war of uh, choice by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, as well as with the engagement of uh, Egypt. Uh, and then the United States have sold massive amount of weapons. And you saw here the picture of Trump when he came back from Saudi Arabia holding a check. Some say it's $400 billion. And 
just like uh, uh, show and tell, uh, giving the press of what he actually cleaned up from uh, bin Salman's pocket, Mohammed bin Salman, who was far more ready than to, to sign. Uh, and this is where uh, the uh, weapons and the companies uh, that have actually benefited from uh, the war uh, that uh, with all indication is uh, have wreaked havoc and uh, in Yemen with uh, massive death of civilians, uh, uh, cholera uh, running rampant in the society and so on. So again, foreign policy and domestic policy and financial priorities uh, are in here, both in here and also the UK and France who continue to sell weapons without any limits. MLK is in his uh, really important speech, The Three Evils of Society, uh, which was on August 31st, 1967, uh, delivered at the National Conference on New Politics, uh, for me is still prophetic. Uh, he said, quote, but our moral lag must be redeemed. When scientific power outruns moral power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men. When we foolishly maximize the minimum and minimize the maximum, we sign the warrant for our own day of doom. It is this moral lag in our thing-oriented society that blinds us to the human reality around us and encourage us in the greed and exploitation which creates the sector of poverty in the midst of wealth. Some have actually said that the United States is a, is a, a global South country or a third world country that is uh, inhabited by few rich billionaires. And uh, you could say that in here it's also a completely uh, a country that does uh, not have its priority streets and our military industrial complex have really seeped and took massive amount of resources and left everybody uh, almost hanging. And a way to substitute for this is to use racial tension as a distraction. Again, racism is a, is a form of distraction. Uh, by stoking racial tension, the fundamental questions uh, are not asked. And also the more that you actually get to generate almost un, uh, uh, uncritically thinking population, that the more those questions about who's benefiting and who's actually living off the massive resources uh, gets to be uh, set aside. So I'm here, I think it's very important for us to think about the relationship of how race and racism gets to be mobilized. Now let me go into racism and delving into the racial disparities in terms of income and resources, which is connected both to neoliberalism, militarism, and then to also challenge the notion uh, that uh, we have made massive progress because you find people uh, that basically are arguing uh, that since the civil rights movement, uh, blacks have made such massive strides and they push and uh, point to a few successful, especially athletes and entertainers. Uh, so they'll pull up an Oprah or a Michael Jordan uh, or some of uh, uh, Jay-Z or some of these uh, individuals uh, to prove that really that uh, we have made such a massive push toward equality and that uh, this notion that there is racial discrimination, racial disparity uh, really are overblown. And more importantly, point to all types of uh, uh, what I consider to be uh, secondhand comments here and there uh, that are not substanti substantiated by research or evidence uh, to actually point to almost give credence to their racist cultural uh, notions or reflect also to some of the um, media that uh, has been engaged in discourses, especially if you think about the role that Fox News have played uh, you'll find them, especially among the white segment of uh, the society, you'll find them amplifying and reflecting this. Now on here, one has to stop, and this is, one has to stop to this fact, that uh, approximately 64% of the registered voters uh, in the United States are white. 
And in essence, uh, uh, the wide segments of our electorate still determines uh, uh, overwhelmingly the election outcomes. Uh, and uh, that fact in there also can be added that uh, their turnout for election is rather very high. Uh, and as such, we are still dealing with the wide backlash is also gets to be articulated in continuously voting for individuals that are still beholden to neoliberal economics and militarism, which tends to actually almost accelerate uh, the level of uh, marginalization of particularly uh, working class and poor whites and is sticking them against uh, marginalized and highly um, um, uh, uh, almost highly kept to the side uh, black uh, communities that have been subject to the distortion, economic distortion, political distortion for a longer period of time. So that's how political mobilization of these notions connected to the electoral politics begins to play a role in here. So thinking in terms of uh, the racial inequality in, in to look at the data, uh, white families have substantially more wealth than black families. Uh, the median net worth of a white household is about 10 times the median net worth of a black household. So again, the median uh, uh, household is 171,000, uh, black household are uh, 17,600. This is, comes from the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances. Uh, 2016, and maybe the figures shifted one way or the other, but at the core that there is a disparity of either nine to 10 times. Uh, now, some would say, well, you know, uh, the reason that uh, blacks are in the position they are in is because they have a bad uh, consumer behavior, but that does not really account uh, to even if you have bad consumer behavior, it should balance out between white, black, white consumer behavior and black consumer, uh, consumer behavior uh, among the particular class configuration. So if you take poor whites, middle class uh, whites and affluent or upwardly mobile whites and same configuration of black, uh, this still the ratio holds. Uh, so in essence in here, what you have is a historical accumulation of wealth that favored the white families uh, versus black families. And you could speak about uh, the access to loans, um, the uh, period actually uh, uh, early on homesteading that was given, land was given to whites. You could speak about the expansion of opportunity to whites in colleges after the Second World War, uh, access to loans, uh, redlining uh, black neighborhoods in general. So you have a whole host of uh, structural elements uh, that have prevented the wealth uh, accumulation of blacks and in essence uh, have structurally created poverty in uh, the African-American uh, African -American black community. Now black, uh, black or African-American household holds significantly less wealth than white households and this is actually takes almost a longer uh, lens to it uh, from 1989 to 2016. So you could see again, uh, even different periods where there is a growth and uh, uh, contraction of the economy, the rate actually uh, is maintained in terms of the gap, but the gap actually increases. So when we have the massive economic growth between 2001, 2002 to 2007, 2008, you actually, uh, you could see that the white um, uh, wealth gap increased in, uh, considerably while the uh, black wealth actually was almost either stagnant or maintained a, a very normal level of uh, uh, not growth, but almost a stable level. Again, this is just uh, something to look at. And this is, comes from the board uh, of uh, governors of the Federal Reserve System, looking at uh, the um, uh, households and uh, the wealth. So no one in their right mind will actually say, just because you have uh, a, an Oprah that has uh, success or Michael Jordan or G 
uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z, that all of a sudden now, all of African Americans have overtaken white. Now, I have also something to say that often our media plays out and hypes out uh, the successful African Americans, especially those who possibly are seen to waste their wealth, maybe in the those who are rappers or uh, those who are in the sports, they use them as a way also to stoke white resentment toward the perceived success and reinforce the notion that whatever uh, black communities have achieved due to the changes in the civil rights and uh, granting of civil rights, that they actually are so irresponsible. In essence, is positing the irresponsibility, thus actually giving the epistemic or the logic for shifting and changing uh, the welfare system, which affects the massive number of poor and middle-class uh, blacks in the society. So in essence, it has a purpose that uh, never miss an opportunity to demonize even the most successful and find ways to actually diminish uh, their status and use it to stoke uh, racial animosity and racial prejudice and racism among especially the working class and poor whites in order for us to drive uh, the needed policy support within that segment of the society. Uh, the Haas um, uh, Institute of um, uh, uh, Fair and Equality, Fair, uh, in, um, Institute for uh, uh, Othering and Belonging, sorry. Uh, the Othering and Belonging, they shift, they change their name, but the othering and belonging that is looked at economic in, in inequality, a defining issue for America's future. And you could see how actually inequality, the top 1%, uh, actually uh, wealth has massively increased, uh, rising share of the national income uh, going to the top 1%, while the others are actually are stagnated. So again, how to shield and how to obfuscate this is part of the, the dynamics that we are seeing. So how to address this uh, average income gap. And again, they looked at it from 1917 to 2012 and looking at the data uh, in there. Uh, so the, those who say that we have made major strides at the civil rights movement and we have uh, progress, uh, this is actually almost uh, shielding us away from the critique that has to be uh, carried out the economic critique and the inequality and in essence how the bottom part of the society which has a larger number of uh, blacks and communities of color as well as again poor whites uh, and I think what we need is to make sure that uh, we think of how poor whites are uh, mobilized in this uh, rise of white nationalism and taking our country back and used as almost a frontline uh, uh, front troops to push an agenda that they all likewise are their, uh, their victim, but they are sold that this is the reason that you are in this position is because uh, the black community or the uh, <clears throat> immigrant community is what's causing you to lose your status. So this is again, for us to think about <clears throat> this rising inequality. Uh, the tax cuts help blacks and Latinos less than whites. Uh, so again, the tax cut, uh, uh, the size of average 2018 cut. Now, whenever we have a tax cut, we have to understand that it's actually, it's a, it's a mechanism of wealth distribution and who holds more of the burden. Uh, and one of the biggest, again, pieces that I said about the taxes is the capital gains tax, which right now stands at 15%. Uh, when Reagan came into office, and I need to check, I think it was about 45%. Uh, if I'm mistaken, I'll take a look and correct it. But again, uh, if you look at where the wealthy, actually, they have a, a part of massive accumulation of wealth, is a result of the shift in the capital gain tax. The assumption is that if you give wealthy more money, they're gonna create jobs. That trickle down economic model has been time and time again proven to be completely erroneous and fictitious at best. Uh, if anything, we have a trickle down economics in the following, we take the poor, flip them upside down and shake their pockets and whatever comes is collected by the 1%. So that's what trickle down economics 
uh, in, in practice. And uh, the taxation system has been a massive wealth redistribution over the past 20, possibly more uh, years since, again, the 1980s, uh, be about 40 years. And if you add to it the militarism, which is also another form of wealth redistribution that takes place from the taxes that should go to schools, hospitals, uh, social programs, uh, mental health, and so on, and you shift it and give it to the major companies that are predominantly uh, the stocks and the shares are held by uh, the 1%, you could see that there has been a massive, massive wealth redistribution uh, that, uh, takes place, that took place and continue uh, to take place as we speak. <clears throat> White families typically have higher income than black families. So in terms of income, annual income, so it's actually almost 60%. Uh, of that of a white uh, family in terms of income. Uh, you add to it that most uh, still blacks, either they don't own their homes or if they do, they have a higher debt uh, acquired over uh, their homes overall. And they often have a much higher interest rate on the homes that they own. So this is another uh, under under uh, underreported and underexamined area, which is the phenomena of uh, the higher interest rates and all of the uh, uh, check cashing uh, companies that open in the poor, the uh, uh, the day uh, the uh, cash check, uh, check cashing systems, the uh, advance on your salary, and so on, that you end up actually paying. Uh, an unbelievable uh, rates, uh, interest rates that are given there, sometimes 25, 29%, 35%, and even higher. Uh, and that's in essence how uh, some make their wealth out of uh, this relationship, almost a pernicious relationship on black communities. Almost every uh, dimension of the economy in the black communities neighborhood is structured to draw out resources uh, out of the black community and to actually almost lock them in a cycle of poverty, even if they own uh, their homes uh, uh, and even if they have a job, they're barely, uh, in general, we have that people don't, can't make uh, do without one month of uh, salary but it's more so in uh, uh, black communities. So again, this is another dimension for it. Now, this is just the most recent since April. <clears throat> there are far more uh, blacks that uh, the unemployment rate is 16.7% and whites are 14.2%. Now, the important thing about the unemployment is that if you look unemployment through a long history, uh, uh, the black communities unemployment has held steady of being one and a half to two percent, sometimes two and a half times as uh, the unemployment rate of um, the white communities. And during economic downturn, uh, they tend to be fired in larger number and to uh, be hired in uh, lesser number uh, overall. So again, this actually gets us into, uh, oops, one second. I, so the unemployment rate is, uh, again, now there are many studies relative to uh, the impact of racism, the uh, 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 not getting a job because of your name, uh, appearing to be black name. Also some of the early screening over the phone, a black sounding voice tend to actually be one where uh, employers would not call you back for the interview. Uh, some identical resumes of white applicants versus black applicants. The white applicants get the job. Then we get into promotions, job security. So there's a whole research on this, uh, looking at the causalities of both uh, uh, black unemployment and also the disparity that exists in there. So that's, uh, again, the data is there. Now looking at the CEO, the number of Fortune 500s and the number of uh, CEOs, uh, which again at the top echelon, uh, Asian and Indians tend to ha have a larger numbers of the CEO positions uh, among uh, 
uh, ethnic groups. Again, the overwhelming percentage are whites. That's still the case. But uh, outside of this, uh, you will have actually a number of individuals uh, from the various racial groups that are within the uh, uh, CEO ranks. Uh, so still the CEO uh, office space is still heavily, heavily uh, dominated by white CEOs. And the Fortune 500 CEO by race and ethnicity, 95.8% are white, uh, non-Hispanic white. Uh, and then you have uh, the Hispanic as being 1.2%, uh, uh, African American as uh, being uh, a point, uh, less than 1%, and then Asian as 1.8%. Uh, so the une and the inequality continues the ladder of leadership if you think about uh, gender as well is there uh, so there's some uh, again uh, when we think about uh, who is the CEO and uh, who is making it to the top jobs uh, still 96 percent uh, are held by white so again individuals who say all these uh, blacks that are taking our jobs or all these Latinos that are taking our jobs. Uh, again, if we looked at the unemployment in there, if we looked at the CEO positions, uh, again, that picture is not there. Now, there are some sectors where there is heavy representation, let's say of Latino uh, population, for example, in increasingly in farm workers or restaurant and uh, uh, hospitality industry, uh, construction, uh, African Americans in terms of government jobs or clerical technicians, um, uh, drivers and so on, so, or in the nursing. So there are certain places, but when we take look at it ag in terms of aggregate, uh, if, the Af if the black community is about 12 point some percentage of the uh, American society, you would think broadly it should be as close to that as possible. And similarly with Latinos, uh, Asians, and so on, it can't be that the genius is only structured around whiteness. And so this is again, how do we get to change uh, this picture? Uh, and how do we get to actually uh, transform uh, uh, this aspect, both in relation to gender and thinking about uh, 96% and 4% as well as in relations to diversity. So it seems it holds in both. Now, interestingly enough, you know, the countries that are led uh, by women prime ministers and presidents have been able to address COVID-19 much better than the two bombastic uh, uh, male figures right now in the world, Johnson in the UK and Trump in the United States. Uh, now, if you look at how change has been brought about, I was aware of, uh, at least knew my uh, colleagues in San Francisco, Eva Patterson, who was the leader at the time of the San Francisco Lawyers Committee of Civil Rights. Uh, the police department was uh, uh, highly, highly discrimi discriminatory toward uh, black uh, police officers as well as uh, other minorities. So they actually, uh, the lawyers committee took him to court and won their case and the police department was under a consent decree to diversify their ranks and similarly for the San Francisco uh, fire department. And now don't take this that I'm all of a sudden supporting the uh, police and their brutality, but just to show that there had to be a, a, a legal intervention uh, in order to bring about a change uh, to a, a police department and a fire department. Now the fire department, the tests and the training manuals actually con were constructed around uh, white identity. So basically agents because of height and particular uh, body build were deemed to be uh, unqualified. So in here, you would think that across the world where Asia is one of the largest continent, you mean that they don't have firefighters and they have to import from other parts of the world. So again, the construction of what we call these uh, uh, measures of exclusion are constructed around cultural aspects, specifically so in order to actually replicate almost the old boys network uh, that you bring in uh, individuals. Sometimes maybe it's not based on in 
uh, a conscious uh, racial uh, lens, but also implicit bias plays a major part of it. So you bring in your cousin, your relative, and so on. So it becomes an old boys network family and cultural specific. So that's why uh, I'm very strong proponent of measures that actually bring about a deliberate uh, ways to change and alter the picture. <clears throat> now, a larger share of black population lives in poverty. Uh, the poverty rate of black Americans is more than double that of whites. Uh, and you could actually take it over a long period of time and it still holds. Uh, the other dimension, which I did not mention, is also uh, indigenous native populations likewise actually compete with the black community in terms of poverty rates. Some goes as high as 26 to 28 percent. And in some of the reservations, uh, uh, really, uh, it's almost some of the most worst conditions that you would not even compare it to some of the uh, possible uh, locations that you find in slums in the global south. And again, I'm not problematizing the global south, but just to say that some of these conditions among the indigenous population is horrific. And therefore, how to actually also bring in both the black community and also the indigenous community, uh, because these are the two major uh, 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 communities that have been uh, almost the country, ha the sin of the country has built upon uh, their both their backs and their death, the genocide against the indigenous population and the enslavement uh, of the black communities, Jim, Jim Crow laws, uh, separate but equal, and all types of exclusion up to the present. So these are the two, uh, you know, you could think about the two major uh, rivers of wrong that the tree of America has been built and grew upon and we still have not recognized nor began to actually uh, do remedies, not, let alone recognize it. You have people still uh, have not even come to the step of recognizing and uh, coming to terms of what happened. Uh, and they throw on you, well, that happened long time ago. Uh, well, how do you explain all of these uh, datas uh, we're not possibly saying that you yourself enslaved that individual, but you are a beneficiary of historical uh, benefits that have been uh, actually acquired as a collective. Uh, so again, this is just uh, for us to look both the indigenous uh, communities uh, and their work is very critical. The work of the International India Treaty Council, the work of American Indian Movement, uh, and the various uh, activists that continue to highlight uh, the indigenous community in here, the uh, Western Shoshone people in Nevada, which actually is one of the most bombed communities uh, as a result of all the experiments and bombing experiments and bombing raids uh, to, for training in Nevada. Uh, and uh, the native population in the Dakota uh, so again, this is another dimension that we need to bring as we are discussing this uh, period of racism. Healthcare, a larger share of black Americans lack health insurance compared to whites, uh, 9.7, uh, but even also the insurance that they hold is often also uh, is inferior to the uh, healthcare uh, or health insurance plans that whites hold. Uh, also, there is a research that uh, blacks who come to the doctor, they get less attention uh, and therefore actually their visit to the doctor might be actually one of the most dangerous because they actually give, give them the sense that there is nothing wrong with you. So this implicit bias, racialized lens is also at the hospital uh, gets to affect uh, uh, black Americans in general. So there has to be any re-examination and rethinking of how race and racism actually impacts uh, even at the, more, at the door of the delivery of healthcare. Now we look at the sports coaching and ownership. Uh, again, everybody's gonna pull, uh, you know, Michael Jordan or uh, uh, LeBron and so on. And the insult that heaved upon them is just a separate issue. Uh, diversity in the NFL as of October 2013, these are the data that I found. Uh, 
most likely they could be updated, but I don't think there will be much change as far as the percentages. Uh, players, 30% uh, of the NFL players are white, 66% are African, uh, African American, black, Latinos are less than 1%, Asian 1%, other are 2%. Head coaches, 88% of the coaches are white, 9% are blacks, 3% are Latino, no Asians or other. The ownership, 97% of the NFL owners are white. Um, and uh, only 3% are Asian, uh, which are only two individuals uh, as a result of this. And this is actually accounts for uh, Kaepernick and what happened to him. Still, uh, the NFL has to apologize uh, to what they have done to him. Uh, and the old boys network that basically uh, did not, uh, was not far away from uh, Trump's uh, worldview considering the owner of the Patriots, uh, who was yesterday just caught, was caught with another cheating uh, episode of uh, videotaping, I think the Cincinnati uh, Bengals. Uh, so uh, videotaping their practice and so on. So how many more, what you call slap on the hand, you're gonna get as a cheat, uh, as an owner. And I'm not even touching his, what you call uh, sexual, uh, escapades in Florida, which likewise seems to him and Trump are buddies on that, but leave that as an issue uh, in there. Uh, so again, the NFL, diversity in the NBA, players are 19% white, 76% are African-Americans, 4% Latino, Asians less than 1% and other less than 1%. Uh, head coaches, there's 53% are white, 43% are uh, black. But majority ownership is 98% is uh, white, and then 2% uh, being uh, actually uh, African Americans or black. If you look at the league office staff, 64% of the league staff is white. Uh, the NFL, 72% of the league staff is white, 9% African American. Now, if you look at this also at the university level, it's almost an identical picture. So we often think of the university system because I look at the university as the uh, gladiator uh, uh, arena for preparation to move into uh, the professional. And it's same, it's almost nerds. Who are these players? Who are the coaches? Who are the administrators? Uh, who are the directors, or athletic directors? It actually reflects this uh, broadly. Uh, in the uh, uh, baseball uh, league, uh, players 61%, African Americans are 8%, Latinos have a higher number, 28%, but the managers again still 87% white, majority owners 98%, only 2% uh, of the Latino, and the league staff, office staff is overwhelmingly white, 69%. So again, this is sports coaching and ownership. Yes, we look at, we watch the games and we see Cam Newton or we see uh, uh, Steph Curry, LeBron James and so on. And we project that to be that they basically are uh, owners uh, of these teams. And then we also look at their uh, salaries. But in here, also don't get carried, out, carried away because whatever contract they have, you have uh, the uh, immediately the manager or the um, uh, uh, agent commission that takes place and varies in terms of commission. Then you have the taxes, you have all kinds of, so really uh, it's an inflated, it's a substantial, again, we're not gonna be downplaying that, but how many of the actual top players get the salaries and then the rest, uh, if you add it up, it averages out uh, and it's not as uh, substantial as the billionaires who are actually the ones that are running the leagues and continue to get uh, the bulk of uh, the revenues and resources. So the five North Americans major leagues will have 150 teams in 2020, but only one black majority owner. So again, this is taking the five North American uh, uh, major leagues, uh, uh, looking at football, basketball, uh, hockey, uh, uh, soccer, and uh, football. And again, you only have one black majority. So again, uh, you could focus on uh, Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson. He has some, uh, some 
uh, 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 what you call uh, share in the Lakers. But aside from this, this is uh, the uh, picture how it looks. Ethnicity of new Fortune 500 board appointments. So we go from ownership, management, uh, staff to uh, board levels. A study of new appointments of the boards of Fortune 500 companies from 2009 to 2016 shows that these seats are still being filled by mostly white men, which again, it becomes the circular of uh, who are the ones that are getting it's over about 80% holding is steady. I know uh, some white men says, you know, we're losing ground. Uh, where did the 20% go? Uh, but claiming that there is a massive loss of status, of position, uh, that we're losing our country, quote, taking our country back. Uh, when again, we could problematize that and where that originates from. But in general, if we look at, again, in every data, uh, the data does not borne out this. And actually, this is a data, um, what you call uh, political sentiments that are being stoked uh, for political reasons. Uh, who holds senior positions in Silicon Valley? Again, in, we're in California, we celebrate, you know, Silicon Valley, you have Apple, you have uh, Cisco, Oracle, uh, Facebook or not Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Uh, so uh, the fact that you have the Silicon Valley and technology, technology reflects the society that it actually comes out of and it's highly, highly uh, distorted relative to uh, the black community and where the Silicon Valley is actually at. Uh, whites still in senior office, uh, uh, senior officers and managers, 70, 76%. Uh, blacks are 1%. Mid-low officer and manager, 62% are white, only 2%. Uh, professional, 52% are white, 2% black. Technician, which is again, uh, when you go to the lower level of um, the economic ranks within the Silicon Valley, you'll find the uh, 8%. Now, you might think that this is only in Silicon Valley. I will actually tell you that at the university level, which supposedly to be enlightened that people are, uh, you will find that at the top level, uh, tenured faculty are between 80 to 90% of all tenured faculty at uh, universities with few exceptions are white. Uh, 78 to 80 percent of them are white male and then if you go down the rank to lecturers or uh, assistant that are still newly into the job you will find that it goes into that uh, blacks or minority faculty are in the 20 to 30 percent give or take uh, depending on the university so again the society that we are looking at is reflective of the university that we're looking at is reflective of the broader society and the questions that we need to ask, what is the role of the university uh, in reproducing this racial and racist uh, type of configuration? More importantly for me, that law schools are supposed to be actually upholding the law and trying to teach the next generation of how to uphold justice. Uh, but if we are seeing that uh, uh, blacks are railroaded into the, the uh, justice system or just us system, then that raises the question of what is the training that individuals are uh, receiving from our uh, law schools and the judges that are sitting at the bench, which law schools have they graduated from and what is it they're upholding? Uh, so we need to critique uh, every element of the society in this moment to actually raise these questions uh, because it's not a matter of only one bad apple, one bad cop Chauvin putting his knee on uh, uh, George Floyd's head for eight minutes and 46 seconds, is the whole society infrastructure that Chauvin represents, that Chauvin is the paradigmatic of all of our society that have its uh, knee uh, at, uh, at the racial inter intercrossing of our society and I think we have a moment of reckoning to begin to critique every element that is in front of us. So you as uh, tech sector executives by race, uh, so 83.31% uh, are uh, in essence white in terms of executive. Uh, Asians are 10.5% uh, with heavy tilt toward Indian 
uh, from Indian subcontinent. Uh, and blacks are 1.92%. And then uh, Latino Hispanic are 3.11%. 3 so this is again the picture from the tech sector, which often is seen as to be next to the apple pie. It is actually as racially uh, hierarchical and struck with uh, racial epistemic as anything else. Most black employees say that they must work harder than their colleagues to advance in their career. This is another notion that we, it's the racial epistemic that blacks are lazy or Latinos are lazy and so on. But the, actually it raises the question, if the Latinos are lazy, why are they hired in so many in large numbers in actually industries that require almost heavy lifting and uh, a, considerable expenditure of effort and, uh, and uh, work to do it. But again, this is the racial epistemic. On the one hand, you diminish the return, you actually give them less, and then you accuse them of being not being hard workers so they would not advance or actually be taken responsibility. And thus you provide or you keep uh, this uh, racial structures of uh, white advance at the expense of others. And again, looking at data from universities, you, this is actually holds uh, not only in relations to uh, the broader economy, but also at institutions that uh, would otherwise be the case. So again, they have to be twice as good because you have to actually uh, break uh, also both in the skills level, but also you have to break uh, the cultural notions that are there that tends to favor uh, forwarding or uh, advancing white uh, individuals within the company, within uh, the ranks of the organization, opposite um, a black, uh, or also you could add other minorities or women in this case. Now this gets us in the coronavirus. Now, black people make up a larger share of US COVID deaths. Uh, they're 13% of the population and they account for 23% of COVID deaths. Uh, in some cities, actually, the rate goes up to 40 to 45% and so on, but then nationally, it's almost twice, uh, or close to twice the percentage, uh, which again is the, uh, we said about healthcare and the uh, health, uh, lack of health insurance, but also that there is a, almost a lack of attention at the visitation of the hospital. Uh, but also one has to say that uh, 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 racism actually creates a, a level of stress and a level of um, uh, almost at the molecular level impact on the individual. Uh, some said, well, blacks have a higher uh, rate of diseases and an unhealthy living. But again, if you compare whites with blacks within the same class configuration, uh, you would say, uh, uh, some whites have a bad uh, diet in, that are poor and blacks have bad diet as poor. Uh, having what you call uh, pre-existing conditions among the same class, even within the same class configuration, the rates of death among black community is higher, which actually again points to uh, other factors that are to play in here relative to the black community. Now, going to the Confederate monuments, and I hopefully am trying to get into uh, the next few slides and then hopefully we'll have some of your questions. Uh, now, the Confederate monuments and statue building, if we look at it, they actually were built uh, after the Civil War. Uh, and in essence, was a way to reconstruct society. So there are individuals who say we need to preserve history because it was history uh, pre-Civil uh, War or pre uh, the end of uh, the Civil War and so on. But actually these monuments were an attempt to construct history in order to actually reaffirm the imagined uh, history and to actually say who belongs or who doesn't belong and reaffirm uh, this notion of uh, that we lost our country. And actually, if you look, the rise of the KKK in the early part of the 20th century corresponds to the spike in the building of monuments uh, and glorification of a past with the claim of, again, that we lost our country. To claim the country back 
was a major theme uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Similarly, you could see there was a decline after the 1920s, uh, but as the civil rights movement took hold in the early 50s into the 60s, there was a reintroduction of these building of these Confederate monuments as a way of, again, asserting who the society. So again, these monuments were a, a, a public representation of uh, claiming the public space for whiteness and affirming it in areas of the society where uh, blacks in particular were, attempt, were actually asserting their rights uh, to um, both public space, but also more importantly, a right of equality within the society. So again, this is uh, looking at it of naming of schools for Confederate leaders. Uh, actually, the overwhelming majority of these schools actually uh, occur uh, post Brown versus Board of Education. In essence, as a way to say that whatever the, whatever the Supreme Court have ruled, our response to it, in essence, or our resistance to it is by affixing uh, Confederate names and Confederate leaders' names to the schools uh, as a way to try to say that you might have uh, one Brown versus Board of Education, but we're not going to allow you to claim the space. And we know that the struggle to desegregate schools continued all the way up to uh, the 70s in many places, if not even uh, to the contemporary period, because you also have a, a different ways where uh, segregation uh, uh, occurred uh, uh, you know, in different locations, especially when you talk about white flight from cities into the suburbs and how uh, uh, other notions, um, a de facto segregation that actually begins to shape its way. So again, you could see where these Confederate monuments uh, uh, begins to take shape uh, within the United States and when do they spike. Uh, again, this is another uh, way to look at it uh, in terms of where these uh, monuments and uh, are uh, being built. Now, I know that some of the activists in Europe are also looking at monuments uh, of uh, both uh, uh, individuals who were engaged in the slave trade, uh, also looking at the, uh, uh, in particular, the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oxford University. Cecil Rhodes, who was engaged as Ministry of Colonies, who called the country on his name, uh, Rhodesia, was engaged in the uh, scramble for Africa. Winston Churchill, who uh, is credited for the Second World War, but the guy uh, never missed an opportunity to be as racist as he could be. He uh, actually uh, uh, almost refused to say that slavery was wrong. He said that uh, he doesn't see anything wrong with the history of slavery. He did not see anything wrong with the uh, genocide of the native population. He was very, very uh, uh, racist toward the Palestinians and the Arabs. Uh, so again, there's a move uh, to challenge these uh, monuments that are placed in public land and an object of glorification and veneration. Uh, so if you want to study history, again, there are books for history and then there is, these could be actually uh, put in a museum. But I'm also uh, for repatriation of a lot of the museum pieces. If you go to the Louvre or the London uh, British Museum, I look at it as being the den of thieves, the 40 thieves, Alibaba and the 40 thieves, Literally in both uh, museums, uh, the 40 thieves left all of their uh, stuff in there. And you just think about how much was actually stolen, pillaged from, uh, looted from the global south and actually put a display in some of these museums across uh, European capitals where you pay a hefty fee just to go and take a look and take a picture. And just think about, I know the critique of looting that took place during the protest uh, we're talking about uh, state, states that have looted and uh, uh, even to the more, to the just recent memory, you just think about all of the monuments and uh, figurines and so on that were looted from Iraq and made itself all the way through the art dealers or the looting of uh, artifacts from Syria or Yemen, or Afghanistan, Libya, uh, some in uh, Central African Republic, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so in here, at least, if, you know, the best you could do maybe just to say, I'm sorry, uh, 
at one level, but to claim that there is some defilement of history and defilement of uh, the cultural heritage of society, I'm trying to see which page that you are reading, because I really would like to go back to page uh, that was written in 1800. I would like to go back to 1850 to 1860, 1882 in Egypt. Uh, I would like to go to the uh, pillaging of and looting of all the materials from the new world. So again, memory and discussions about monuments and what do they mean, and all of a sudden, all these uh, racist expert coming as a claiming of history. Uh, I'm trying to see which part of history uh, have you been missing and the, uh, are you ready to actually re, uh, restitute and send back all these uh, treasures that are sitting in there and also to pay back uh, compensation that you have been keeping them in the Louvre and uh, welcoming people that are paying 60, 70 or 100 euros and taking pictures and having these receptions for stolen property. And uh, it's, there's no two ways about it. Uh, this is a pure fact. Again, looking at where all these monuments and schools and the courthouses in the, in the South, uh, this is again, it's the struggle of uh, these uh, in, the, in the US in the southern part of the United States. Now Stone Mountain, 1915-1970, began in 1915 and culminated in 1972. Uh, this is actually, some see the monument as the largest shrine to white supremacy in the history of the world. Uh, in the, it's in outside of Atlanta, actually I went and saw it when I was visited to see what, what is this all about. Uh, is the largest silent stone in the world, one mile from base to summit. On its highest uh, pinnacle, the Knights of the KKK organized at midnight, November 25th, 1915. So there is an immediate connection to this. Uh, so again, uh, we're not talking about a distant past, but rather actually still with us uh, till today. Uh, moving to lynchings in 12 southern states. Uh, if you look at where these monuments are and the history of lynching, it actually almost corresponds uh, to this uh, terrorizing of the black communities that took place in there. Prisons and shrinking democracy, Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, uh, incarcerated Americans 1920 to 2013. And I know that Biden also was part of the 1994 uh, 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 crime bill, which in essence, it was highly, highly uh, racialized, structured around race. The whole drug war was also crafted around race. Uh, interesting at a time where Reagan was fighting low intensity warfare, whether it's in Afghanistan, Latin America, uh, facilitated or at least worked with uh, CIA operatives to bring the drugs from those areas to actually finance uh, the wars, the uh, that illegal wars that were being carried on simultaneously, but the price was paid by the black community uh, and continues to be paid. And so again, this is, and I argue that uh, prisons and the prison industrial complex was one way to uh, actually uh, undo the effects of the Civil Rights uh, Act and the Civil Rights Movement and using prisons as a substitute for the same type of Jim Crow laws that were in place uh, to uh, keep the black community in a, a disadvantaged position. So again, uh, past month illicit drug use, you could have a war on drugs and uh, when what is launched in 1971 and then accelerates uh, the U.S. state and federal prisons population has increased over 800% in just 40 years. In the state of California, as a result of all types of war on drugs and three strikes, you're out. We built uh, 23 new prisons while only built one university. So we run two educational systems. One is complete failure, which is uh, really locking up human potential and highly structured around race, which is the prison and then the university system. In terms of past month illicit drug use, uh, this is a, just a, uh, a short from 2013. I thought it was interesting. Uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, uh, white 9.5%, black 10.5%, drug-related arrest per 100,000. Uh, we could see that white was 332 or blacks 879, almost three times or as close to two and a half times 
the uh, rate. So it's actually, and then the, dis the disproportionate uh, prison uh, uh, sentences that were given. Imprisonment is a structural response to empowerment. One in three African-American or black men is in jail compared to white men, one in 17. The same in terms of white women, one in 111 versus black women, one in 18. So this is again, is another way. Uh, shrinking democracy is structural and this is the privatization of jails and uh, targeting of uh, a black community. Uh, World incarceration raised the highest rate in the world. Uh, incarceration is Oklahoma, Louisiana, and then the United States as a whole. Then you get El Salvador, Tur Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, and then Cuba uh, in relations to the prison population. And when we talk about Oklahoma, Louisiana, and the United States is heavily tilted toward African-American, black community as well, and then second Latino. Uh, black Americans, two times more likely than whites to be killed by police. Uh, and again, percent disparity between East states, uh, African American population and percentage of black killed by police in 2019. So you could see uh, this two times. This is mapping police violence. Uh, difference between the proportion of victims killed by police by race, ethnicity compared to annual US population estimates. So again, uh, uh, the disparity is still there and the heavy uh, burden that, or the heavy toll that is extracted relative to uh, black communities versus um, white communities. Again, victim killed by police by race, ethnicity compared to the US population. So you could see the percentage, uh, US percentage of population versus percent of all those killed by police. And uh, the same in here in terms of white, the population and the killed by police. So African-Americans in relations to their percentage is almost twice. Uh, I say this because there's some that say, well, there's equal number of whites that are killed like blacks in here. It's only, if you cannot only compare in terms of actual just raw numbers, but you need to, to equate it to percentage of populations. And then also, looking at uh, blacks who, whether they have weapons or not, uh, and how they're dealt with, there are more blacks that are killed without having any weapons on them compared to whites who have weapons that actually don't get killed as a result of their interaction. So the data is consistent in their groups most likely to be killed by law enforcement. African-American, black, uh, age 20 to 24 are the highest. Uh, followed by Native American, age 25 to 34. Then if you look at the next uh, Native American, 35 to 44, then African American, 25 to 34, and so on. So again, uh, of all races is 1.2%, but the African American is 7.1% uh, between age to 20 to 24. That's why if you are a black person and you make it beyond the age 24, uh, your chances of actually being killed by law enforcement actually begin to decrease, which is a sad commentary on uh, how our society is structured that your uh, blackness and your age uh, in particular can determine your likelihood of uh, being killed by police rather than being saved or secured by uh, individuals that we pay their salaries. So uh, this was my last as, um, slide. Uh, on next Tuesday, July 4th, I'm having a conversation on narrating the history of black Muslim communities in the Bay Area. Uh, so for those who are able to join us, uh, we'll have Imam Abu Qadir Amin, uh, Imam Fahim Shu'aib, and Sheikh Abdul Rauf Nasser. Uh, they're long, uh, long time, uh, uh, African-American imams, leaders of the uh, black Muslim community in the Bay Area. This is a conversation that is really um, looking forward to it, uh, to make sure that we get the history narrated and uh, provide a much deeper and longer engagement with the history of Islam in uh, the Bay Area. So thank you for being with me. I, I went an hour and a half, but I think covered a lot. So if, let me see if there's any chats, questions in here. Uh, it is it's too expensive to be poor in America. Absolutely. Uh, 
Khaled Hijazi said you're Dixieland. Oh, well, Dixieland, yes, it is. So let's see if you have any questions, if you wanna put the question, the question and answer, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And we could come back from stopping the sharing of the, so we could get back to, so let's see. So Khaled, you have a question? Uh, let me see. Trying to see if I'm able to. So, Khaled, you could go ahead and talk, and I could hear you. Can you talk? Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, for me, as a Palestinian refugee, you know, it is uh, relevant. And my question, uh, Dr. Hatem, was. If you can, uh, can you, uh, or have you looked at, uh, at the similarities between uh, the Palestinian community that lives inside what is called Israel uh, and, and their social and, uh, behavior, uh, you know, in comparison to the African-Americans here? I mean, from, from my readings, I did see actually quite uh, a great deal of similarities as far as uh, number of inmates in jail, uh, uh, violence, uh, homicide, even prostitution, all of that is highest amongst the Palestinians uh, inside uh, the 1948 land. So, uh, I mean, if you can comment on this or if you've uh, come across any readings on this. Well, I, I, rather than thinking in it in terms of as a comparison between Palestinians and the black community, I think the black community's experience is unique and ha every, every experience is to be studied in its uniqueness and what it faces. But broadly speaking, if we speak about colonialism and settler colonialism, uh, which is what we face uh, in the history of the United States, the, the United States is one of the uh, most enduring and one can argue is the most successful settler colonial project. And saying successful in here, not in a positive sense, but in a sense of what it has done uh, for the indigenous population on the one hand, uh, and then the enslavement of uh, a, 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 a level of maybe 12 to 13, maybe 14 million to a high of 35 to 40 million uh, blacks from Africa that were brought in the hulls of ships uh, and kept in bondage for over 250 years. Then another uh, period of uh, complete uh, terrorization under the Jim Crow laws with uh, lynchings. Uh, so there's that part. In terms of what the Israelis relative to the Palestinians, you have a settler colonialism. So it has features that are uh, uh, in essence are normative. Uh, so uh, uh, settler colonialism and colonialism has normative features. It's uh, highly st structured around race. Uh, so there is a racial epistemic. So if you study the uh, experience of South Africa in relations to the Dutch and the British relative to apartheid, that was structured around race. Australia with the Aborigines uh, is structured around race. And the Palestinians, again, face the same type of dynamic relative to race. It also uh, is connected between military industrial complex technology and capitalism in the same way. And again, Israel actually puts itself as a startup company. If we think about the technologies, the, the structures that were put in practice here in the, in the new world uh, that decimated the indigenous population and kept in bondage the, uh, uh, the black population, same, similar things. Uh, third, uh, the uh, introduction of religious or religion, religious epistemic uh, uh, you could see that within uh, the experience of all the blacks. And now there's a whole debate about the whiteness of Jesus. And I know uh, our colleague, uh, Sean King, who brought uh, the, there is the images of the white Jesus in there, which also creates the superiority of God or the notion of God uh, that we have internalized. And interestingly enough, um, um, Imam Abdul Qadir al-Amin from San Francisco actually uh, at a certain point was engaged in uh, 
uh, a protest or a picket with the Third Baptist uh, Church with uh, Reverend Amos Brown because the picture of Jesus in the, Af in the black church in uh, San Francisco uh, Western Edition was of a white Jesus. So again, the religion and how religion gets to be shaped around uh, whiteness, manifest destiny, and so on, it's a feature of um, the uh, settler colonialism and, and so on. So these are features that have to be looked upon and uh, how to begin to understand uh, their mobilization in the particular uh, notion. I do believe that what the, Af what the black community have experienced, what the native uh, indigenous community have experienced, it's at a level that is distinct uh, and uh, at a much, much more uh, uh, different level than what the Palestinians, and this is again speaking and knowing the Palestinian experience, sometimes as a way to compare, uh, we tend to overlook at uh, the uh, overwhelming uh, uh, structure uh, that have been placed on the black community from the moment of capture in uh, West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa to the current period. And I think sometimes uh, the comparisons can tend to do un injustice while being aware that we need to actually uh, develop solidarity. So solidarity is important, but solidarity has to actually uh, take account and allow the uh, narrative of each community to be actually uh, articulated. And we should be individuals that are empathetic in how we can relate to one another because we're both, in essence, if you, if you have lived in the modern world, you have faced the racial modernity that actually erases, uh, attempts to erase your humanness at the human level. And sometimes as a way to try to uh, engage and narrate our story, we tend to think that our story is the most important story. And I understand this, but actually our story is often is in conversation. And we need to look at it that this conversation, each strand of it uh, has to have its right do and its right uh, moments in order for us to be uh, at least correct to history, but also to correct to the circumstances. I do believe that solidarity is very, very important, that comparative, comparis, comparing notes is very important. It's also modes of resistance, comparing modes of resistance is very important. A lot for us as Palestinians to learn from the black experience. And a lot from the black experience can also uh, learn and relate to uh, the Palestinian experience and also to point to the contradiction that exists in both of us. Uh, uh, these are part, you know, solidarity and building solidarity is heavy lifting. It's not easy uh, because you have to actually, it's almost you're doing a mental surgery for yourself. You're, you have to decipher and un open up both the pain, but also to overcome your pain, to see the story of another uh, uh, demonized, erased, completely obliterated uh, community and to see to that you're uplifting yourself is has only has the meaning if you uplift them and you simultaneously without actually uh, building and reconfiguring the tension. Uh, I tend to think it's one of the most difficult uh, enterprises, but it was done. Uh, my sense that the the anti-colonial struggles uh, that took place in the 50s and the 60s, there were some considerable considerable. Uh, uh, solidarities that have been uh, formed. It's not, it's, it's not coincidental that, uh, that Malcolm X went and visited Gaza. It's not coincidental that he ended up in Egypt. It's not coincidental that he visited Algeria. It's not co co uh, coincidental that he actually was part of the Organization of African Unity. It's not coincidental that the ANC trained with the Palestinians in Algeria and, and in Lebanon. It's not coincidental that a lot of the a considerable number of the Black Panther Party Party, individual at the U.S. unleashed its Cointel Pro, unleashed its violence against them, that they sought refuge in Egypt, in Algeria, in Lebanon, in other places in uh, parts of the Arab and Muslim world. But that does not absolve the Arab and Muslim world of their rac racial notions that we, we have adopted Eurocentricity. We see ourselves as being what you call privileged whites because we wanted to live and be 
in essence, touched by the superior. We want to see ourselves that we have arrived at some type of a, uh, a whiteness. We look at, I say always, we, we want to be part of looking at the white city upon the hill. And therefore, in doing so, we often actually uh, look at the wrong type of alliance as a long type of solidarity. So we busy ourselves with all types of relationship that uh, does not empower us or empowers the community that uh, are really need to be uh, part of the alliances that uh, we, we form. So again, I think this is, for me, it's a long answer, but it's an, an important question that needed uh, some considerable uh, engagement. Yeah, so does that uh, address your question, Khaled? <laughs> And I see Nabila also uh, have joined us. How are you, Nabila? It's good to see you. Go ahead, Khaled. You could comment. Thank you, Hatem. This was excellent. Oh, thank you, Nabila. It's good to see you and welcome. <laughs> yeah. So when is the next one? July 7th? July 7th with Abu Qadr al-Amin, uh, Imam Fahim Shaib. What uh, time? Uh, it should be around the same time or maybe 6. Uh, oh. uh, and there six, is nothing, nothing until July 7th. We have the mm -hmm. uh, protest that we're having on uh, July 4th. But actually I wanted to actually have a conversation with you about the uh, some of the history of uh, Arab, Palestinians, academics, and so on with you, because you also have a rich uh, reservoir of experience and, inf and material that I would like to have you. And also maybe I thought about maybe bringing um, May Sikli with you to have a conversation. Oh, May, you yeah. mean May Say Ali? Oh, yeah, May Say Ali from uh, Michigan. Michigan, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think yeah. that conversation is needed because it's a, there's a, a history of almost 20, 25 years that people are not privy to it. And I think it would be important for us uh, to have. So I'll knock on your door for scheduling something soon. Inshallah, inshallah. Right. Faber, I see you'll join us. So please, if you have any question. Faber? Assalamu I could hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm going to make my comment, Dr. Hatim. Is this uh, the right? Go ahead, Khaled, and then I'll take uh, Saber, okay. and then we'll conclude. So, with yeah. That. So what I wanted to say, uh, you know, actually what I wanted to say, you know, there is a uh, version, I'm going to quote uh, this uh, French historian, Alex uh, de Tocqueville, yeah. who came to the United States back uh, right after the Civil War. And he said, you know, he quoted, he said that when he went to the North and then came back to the South, and he said, I noticed that there is a culture of repugnance, you know, in the North and under the, the South, once slavery is, uh, is uh, uh, abolished, uh, there will be a culture of uh, repugnance like the North. So mm -hmm. the point that I wanted to say, Dr. Hatem, here is that, you know, under uh, settler colonialism, yeah. for us Palestinians, we are meant to be replaced. We are not wanted. And the same thing with African-Americans, there was a job for them to be enslaved. Yeah. But then, and let's say like after, you know, the, the civil rights, yeah. Because before the civil rights and after slavery, there was uh, a systemic uh, de jure uh, yeah. type of uh, discrimination. But after the civil rights, they became also uh, uh, people who are undesired, unwanted. Yeah. And, and, and there were also you know, uh, systems you know, of apartheid applied on them uh, in the same manner that are applied on Palestinians. And what happens is that this destroys people. And unfortunately, it has destroyed the society of African Americans here, in the same manner that it has destroyed the society of the Palestinians who live inside, quote, you know, that 1948, to a point where you see a large percentage of uh, drug dealers, for instance, in cities like Akka and Led the Ramli and and all of that. So this is that this is that this was uh, the point that I wanted to say. And I think you know the way to resolve this is to invoke history and to show because historical. Uh, his, history is a political act, basically, uh, to, to invoke history and show and go back to the historical perspective and show how uh, injustice has been 
uh, administered upon African Americans there here and uh, you know like uh, Palestinians. So that's uh, yeah, that's what I want no, to say. No, I I I I understand the uh, comparative lens, and I do engage in comparative studies, especially for refugees, immigrations, also political struggles. But I would maybe cautious uh, Palestinians and individuals who want to engage with the Palestine cause, that sometimes the comparison uh, has a time and a place, and the comparisons also uh, have to be that is mutually reciprocal at the time that is being engaged with. Uh, otherwise, it actually becomes a form of silencing act at a moment where the uh, focus and the attention should be on those who are facing the injury. And I, this is, again, I engage with Palestine because that's what I work on uh, considerably. So I just want to caution that we don't make the story right now uh, begin to be intertwined into our narrative. Uh, we have enough material to deal with Palestine without having to make the comparative the way for us to engage because it does begin to, to appear even if it's not consciously in the subconscious, it begins to appear that we are basically are trying to jump in front of uh, a, uh, a discourse that rightly at this moment has opened up the door. I tend to believe that uh, as much as possible to amplify the black struggle is part of our liberation. And I don't need to see myself in order for me to actually she see that uh, their freedom and their uh, uh, arrival at this moment is so critical and long overdue. So that's my cautious, that, that's all. So Sabir, I'll take your question and then I'll conclude inshallah, because I have. Uh, salam alaikum, thank you very much. I, I just want, uh, wanted to let you know, I was watching on uh, Facebook. Uh, then I, I, yeah, so I watched the whole lecture, uh, Good. mashallah. Good. Thank you. Very nice, and uh, it was uh, lots of data, you know, well, it was hard to, to fathom all of that data. Well, we have to look at data, the, you know, otherwise people just keep what you call pushing all kinds of uh, uh, distortions and shape people's emotions to stoke it for political gains. And I think what we need is to insist on a sound data and sound analysis. It doesn't mean that data is always 100%, but at least it gives us a way to, to make sound analysis uh, based on data. Uh, we're definitely having a period where uh, not only that the president is factually challenged, but he actually have al uh, he has alternative facts that are based on lies. Uh, so we have to constantly uh, actually shift and make sure that facts do still matter. And uh, data is very critical, especially when we're dealing with this circumstance. Uh, I agree with you, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna take long. Uh... Just wanted to, uh, I guess, uh, you know, give an, like a, you know, a small uh, opinion. Uh, going through all this, uh, doctor, we we have no choice but to look at the the political agendas of the people, uh, you know, running. Let's say, for example, the the U.S. Because at the end, you know, it's in their hands to make the changes and to, uh, you know, decide the policies that will make changes for the good or for the bad. In this regard, I, I just wanted to take your thoughts on, um, you know, we live in California, for example, and it is literally, you know, easier probably to build a rocket, you know, going to the moon than to, let's say, manage, uh, you know, a small business or let's say, uh, buy land and build your house because of the uh, huge amount of regulation that is stopping people and namely people of color from accessing the wealth, from accessing land, from, uh, you know, accessing wealth in general. Mm -hmm. So I, I would argue, you know, the, the, the this regulation, you know, we, we have to, to move toward deregulation to allow people yeah. of color to access, uh, you know. 
Well, uh, so the, the, this is I, I didn't want to take long just yeah. on the on the point of regulation versus deregulation. Well, uh, again, the push for deregulations right now is being constructed under a neoliberal regime. So, in essence, is not set up to support or help uh, the marginalized, the poor, those at uh, communities of color, the blacks and Latinos. So. If you push for deregulations, actually accelerate uh, the rate of dispossession and the rate of marginalization. That doesn't mean that there are there aren't certain regulations that needs to be examined. But what we need is to think of the structure where these deregulations uh, or approach to deregulations need to take place. First, you need to address the structure before you actually approach the particular. Otherwise you're amplifying uh, this 40-year uh, march uh, toward neoliberal economics that accelerated the concentration of wealth in the hands of the 1%. And if you deregulate further, it will actually even increase the rate. We'll actually will end up with a big Amazon warehouse and a big Walmart warehouse. And you just basically a delivery between these two major conglomerates, and then the others will be maybe the tech companies that are facilitating these two operations. So we need to be very careful of using the particular without actually thinking of the larger question of neoliberal economics and make sure that we actually begin to assert the need for a considerable shift and change uh, to occur. So I wanna stop right now because I do have to uh, go attend to my prayer, otherwise I'll miss it. But uh, thank you for being with me and uh, hopefully I'll announce the next one. Khaled, I see that you have your hand, but we'll have a, another discussion, inshallah. So jazakumullah khair and assalamu alaikum. And hopefully thank you, you have been, Thank you. Hopefully you enjoyed our uh, long discussion today.